a brain on a chip, singularity, the metaverse, neuromorphic computing, a lot of complex concepts which I hope to be able to demystify and untangle for you today. My name is Abdullah Kablan. Throughout my career, I founded a number of companies specializing mainly but not exclusively in artificial intelligence, machine learning, some of which were successful, a lot of which were miserable failures. But I've learned much more from the failures than I did from the successes. And today I was introduced to you as a serial tech entrepreneur, investor, expert, which in the past would have filled me with happiness and joy and sense of achievement to hear such titles. But not today. Maybe because I changed, maybe because my priorities have changed, or maybe because the world has changed. So when I look and reflect and see what am I proud of, I think I'm proud of many other things that are not just career-related. One of which, and the most important to me, is the fact that I'm a father. So please allow me to reintroduce myself. <laughs> My name is Abdullah Kablan, and I'm the co-founder of two beautiful little boys, Moody and Zaido. And to me, the, the story of my own children is, is something that I'm quite passionate about. For those of you who have experienced the beautiful feeling of parenthood, or fatherhood, or motherhood, number one, you understand that suddenly the weight of the world is on your shoulders, and you are responsible of the future of your offspring. But number two, it fills you with hope and strive to make the world better for them. But when I look at my kids, something different happened to them than what happened in my generation. They were born in two completely different worlds. Moody was born in 2017 to a cheering crowd of nurses and doctors at Guy's and St. Thomas, greeted by the most beautiful view of London. And I've just exited a company back then, so I was happy. My beautiful wife was happy. We're all like enjoying the moment, and I've just started another company, hoping to grow it. Zaid, on the other hand, was born in 2020, in exactly the same room. And it was a coincidence, complete coincidence, but to a completely different world. Zaid was born in April 2020, the first peak of the COVID pandemic, something which was quite new to all of us. He was not greeted by a cheering crowd of nurses and doctors. Everyone was actually panicking. What is this something new? There's a pandemic going on. When my wife was giving birth at the seventh floor of Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital, Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the UK, was on the sixth floor <laughs> fighting for his life, being moved to a ventilator. So, Everyone was really worried. Security all around the office, people in azimuth suits checking what's going on. I actually almost missed the birth of my own son. And I realized that it was the same place, but two different realities. We are faced with a pandemic, something that my generation, or even my parents' generation, have, have, have not seen before. So. I started like looking, what, what does this bring? What does this mean? So I exited my company again. And moral of the story here, it's not whenever I have a baby, I exit my company. <laughs> if that's the case, I'll be having much more babies. But I just wanted to see what is about to happen in the world, because I believe that we're truly at a pivotal point in, in our history. Because if you look back, there's something very specific about pandemics. Pandemics have two main properties. They're forgettable, and they spark innovation. Forgettable because the human brain is wired to actually forget everything that humans did not cause themselves, whether it's first majeure or act of God or something that we have not done. We actually forget. If you look at the previous pandemic, the Spanish flu, which a lot of us have only heard about after COVID has happened, it actually coincided with World War I. Much more people died in the Spanish flu than people that have died in World War I. 
yet we see much more movies, poems, songs about World War I than we see about the Spanish flu. Mainly because one is a war that man or humans have caused, and the other one is, is something that's completely external. So all the masks and everything we've gone through in the past two and a half years, I know it's forgettable, and for those of you who don't know that, that's like good news, we will forget about it. But secondly, it does spark innovation. There are many stories about this, like for instance, Isaac Newton discovered gravity and saw the apple falling during the Black Death. He was actually socially distancing from everyone. That's why he had the time to see the apple falling. Albert Einstein has done most of his work on relativity during the Spanish flu. So those are periods that spark innovation. Also, there are two other sub-properties of pandemics. The property of pandemic that a lot of people fail to see is that historically, Unfortunately, people die in pandemics, but also the economies die. COVID was the first pandemic in human history where, unfortunately, people have died, but the economies did not die. And that's for one reason. The reason is that because in 2020, the digital migration has been complete. We've suddenly moved our entire life to the digital world, whether we know it consciously or we don't know it. We started consuming academia online. We started doing our business online. Our financials, our transactions have moved online. Even medical tech have moved online. The internet has suddenly become a utility, a part of our life. And for that reason, the economies of the world did not die, unlike any other previous pandemic. But that runs on an infrastructure that a lot of people fail to notice. The infrastructure is called the semiconductor. Every single device that we use has a piece of machinery inside it called the semiconductors, that black chip that you see there. And a lot of you might have heard that there's a global shortage around the world in, 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 in chips at the moment, mainly because production has increased quite a lot, supply chain has been disrupted, and we are not able to even produce the infrastructure that is powering everything that we're doing. It's not magic that we just click a button and we have 500 people on Zoom that requires massive infrastructure underneath it. However, unfortunately, the semiconductor architecture is completely flawed. And without going too technical in this, semiconductor architecture of almost every device we're using today is based on something called the von Neumann architecture, which is, simply put, a design where you have somewhere to store the memory and the other place to put the processing. And the arms race for the past 50 years was to bring memory and processing as close as each other to make devices better, faster, easier to use, smarter, and all that. However, if you look at the most sophisticated supercomputer in existence, the human brain, which unfortunately we have not evolved as a species to utilize even 9% of its processing capacity, processing and memory in our brains have never been split. They all happen exactly in the same unit on a, on a neurological level. So for that reason, there's a new wave of semiconductors that are called neuromorphic computing semiconductors that are inspired by the human brain. And that is fueling a new wave in artificial intelligence that is making it better, faster, and easier to make and easier to manufacture and consume less energy. Practically speaking, the human brain, which is, as I said, a supercomputer, consumes less than 40 watts. The world's best supercomputer at the moment consumes almost 40 gigawatts at any given time. That's a huge difference. We live in a world where we have already become cyborgs. Like we're speaking about cybernetics and, and robotics, but if you think about it, the mobile phone that each and every one of us carries with them all the time, that's become the fifth limb. A lot of people are actually experiencing phantom limb syndrome, which is people who unfortunately lose a limb. They have phantom limb, which they feel that that limb is almost there. If we forget our phone at home, sometimes we feel the vibration in our pocket. We feel like it is there. And that means that we've already been wired. And that is a notion that's exciting from an intellectual property standpoint and the research and development standpoint, but it's equally scary. Does this mean that we're about to reach singularity?
Now, Singularity, for those of you that don't know what it is, it is an area in AI where artificial intelligence will one day supersede human intelligence and becomes better. And it will happen. It's inevitable. I know that my kids, probably in 20, 25 years' time from now, they'll either have their best friend as a robot, or they may be leading the human rebellion against the robots in a post-apocalyptic world like we've seen in the movie Terminator. This is not far-fetched, but today it is not going to happen because robotics have not advanced enough. With time, it will get there. And that's why, coming back to my initial point and the weight on my shoulder, for my offspring and for future generation, that we need to be responsible when we're building such technologies. We need to understand our own psychology, our own brain structures. Humans, we are irrational, but we're predictably irrational. We keep on repeating exactly the same mistakes over and over and over again. Our history is replete with instances where we have self-destructed. And nowadays, we're witnessing similar instances, unfortunately. So we need to understand how our brain works. Secondly, the other point is that all of us have experienced Zoom during COVID. All of us have experienced trying to communicate with each other via video conferencing. Video conferencing lacks one thing. It lacks what we've all noticed. is very difficult to convey energy through a video call. It's very difficult to stay engaged. It's exactly the same. I mean, I can watch a concert on YouTube, but it does not feel anywhere as similar as actually being in the concert itself. And that's because of immersiveness. But in parallel to all of that two-dimensional world that video conferencing have enabled for us, we have the rise of virtual reality. Now, virtual reality is actually touching a, a pain point in, 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 in the way our brain is structured. Due to their immersive nature, they actually make us produce the exact same chemicals that we produce when we have a real life experience. So when you go to an event, for example, or to a concert, the reason why you feel the buzz and you, you feel like that this is really cool and I like it is because suddenly your brain starts producing dopamine, starts producing serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins, all the good stuff that our brain actually does produce when we are at a real life experience. Virtual reality helps us recreate that. And for that reason, moving into a different world that is three-dimensional, paving the way to what is now known as the metaverse, is actually going to be inevitable, especially with the rise and the fast advancement on the semiconductor front. It is something that, personally, on a personal level, I've tried some years ago, in 2016, at the Microsoft Accelerator here in London. I was one of the first people that have experienced the HoloLens. In 2017, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I presented a virtual reality platform for financial trading. They both failed. The time was not right. The technology was a bit early. It was slightly ahead of its time, like many other innovations. But now, because of the digital migration, because of moving into a new world, we are witnessing what is known as the metaverse. Now, for those of you who are hearing about the metaverse and they don't know what the metaverse is, it's practically the successor state of the internet. If you think about the internet as a two-dimensional space, the metaverse is the internet in 3D. So you're practically being moved inside the internet. And that's going to open the door for a lot of innovations. We're going to market products differently because we're going to start thinking in three dimensions. We're going to transact. We're going to exchange value in a very, very different way. A lot of people are saying, oh, that's something for gamers, and video gamers are the ones that do that. We don't understand it. That's not bad. In fact, video gamers have always come before. If you think about it, we've, or at least people in my generation, we've all played Super Mario and Space Invaders 15 years before we used Google. <laughs> so gamers always come first, and gamers have been playing VR games for the past 10 years. So it is now time that almost every one of us within the next five years is going to have a headset on their faces instead of the phone in your hand it is going to move quite closer. And that means that we need to reinvent the way we even think of value. Not everything is or should be captured in monetary terms. Due to blockchain technology nowadays, it helps us to come up with different ways for the exchange of value 
to have trust in a decentralized manner. We do not trust one entity. Some companies around the world are even rebranding their names to jump on the hype of this, but in reality, they are central companies with central authorities on you and your data, and they handle innovation in a way as pretty much from a financial standpoint. But in reality, this field is incredibly promising. And if it's combined with decentralized ledgers and technologies that are actually trustless because they have trust enabled within the te technology itself, then it's going to be a completely different paradigm. A lot of people who look at blockchain and DLT and think it's related to cryptocurrency, it may be because if you think about it throughout history, if you want to build a civilization, you need two things, a system of trade and a store of value. System of trade could be mm, exchanging, bartering, I give you a goat, you give me a cow, and we're exchanging accordingly, or we exchange money. A store of value could be assets, commodities, money, gold, silver, fiat currency or, or money. But if you think about the world's biggest currency at the moment, the US dollar, its value is based on nothing but a promise from a government that has tens of trillions of dollars in debt. So even though that piece of paper actually says, in God we trust, you really should not trust that piece of paper whatsoever. So due to that, these technologies are actually disrupting the way we're going to exchange value. And think about a world where we are virtual, we are in a metaverse, where we are exchanging digital assets. People are exchanging assets nowadays that are virtual, whether it's pieces of lands, whether it's clothes for their avatar, and they're exchanging those for value. And that value needs to be encapsulated in a way different than the money that we have. And that brings the value of blockchain interacting within the metaverse based on such technology. The opportunity is huge. And if you look at slides like these by investors, they, they'll just put in the money. But I want to convey a message where value is greater than money. If we seek value, is we, if we seek creating impact, if we seek looking at technology from a completely different perspective, money will follow. Money always follows innovation, follows value creation. But if we keep money as the main point, that's where it will never lead us anywhere useful for us as a species in general. And that's where, as I said, it could be different priorities, it could be age. But if we collectively think about value instead of just monetary terms, I think we'll all live in a better world. We need to take action. Personally, my recommendation to everyone, especially at a young age, university students, you need to do something. Look at the world around you. Try to analyze it and analyze it yourself. Don't rely on the information that is being fed to you. Be brave. Take the plunge. I mentioned my failures, and they're dearer to my heart than my actual successes. But when you fail, you just become stronger to succeed next time. And if you fail again, you just try again. But most importantly, be responsible. It is not about us. It's not only about family that we belong to. It's about us all collectively. We need to create value in a way that is responsible in order for us to have longevity for the world. We need to plan, then act. And this is a very important point. A lot of people come to me and say, hey, I cannot start, I have great ideas. You need to do both. Planning on its own will never work. One hour of action is better than a thousand hours of thinking. But you need to always have a plan. And if you're procrastinating in order for you to do the planning, then stop planning and just do an action and feel it and try it. And if it doesn't work, know that now you need a plan. If you are doing many things, taking action, but you have no plans, you'll get nowhere. So try to do both. And if you do both, that's potentially going to lead to success. Thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs>